Good to see you. My name is Rob Casper. I'm the head of the Poetry and Literature Center at the Library of Congress. And it's very exciting to be here today for our uh, Poetry with a Purpose event featuring Jericho Brown and Dorian Lux. Since 2017, this pavilion has featured readings of literary writers reading their work and participating in conversations moderated by the Library of Congress and National Endowment for the Arts staff. I'm excited to be a part of this pairing for our Poetry with a Purpose event featuring poets and former NEA fellows, Jericho Brown and Dorian Lux. And if you want to find out more about the National Endowment for the Arts, you can go check out their materials in the back. Brown is the author of three poetry collections, including The Tradition, published this April by Copper Canyon Press, as well as The New Testament, which received the Ainsfield Wolf Book Award in 2015, and Please, winner of an American Book Award in 2009. He is currently an associate professor and the director of the creative writing program at Emory University in Atlanta. Dorian Lux is the author of Only As the Day is Long, New and Selected Poems, published by W.W. W. Norton and Company in January of this year. It is her sixth poetry collection after The Book of Men, which received the Patterson Prize in 2011 and Facts About the Moon, winner of the 2005 Oregon Book Award. She's also the author, the co-author of The Poet's Companion, A Guide to the Pleasures of Writing Poetry. Lux has taught creative writing at the University of Oregon, Pacific University, and North Carolina State University, where she is a professor of English and the director of the creative writing program. Please join me in welcoming first Jericho Brown and then Dorian Lux. Hi, I'm so happy to be here. Thank you so much, Rob, for that introduction. Can I just read y'all some poems? Yeah. I'm gonna read you some poems from a new book I wrote. It's called um, The Tradition. She's 23 weeks old. Yeah. It's like she's can all, she can already walk by herself. And look, I always tell people, this is, and this is the truth. You don't have to like these poems <laughs> to buy the book. <laughs> And I'll tell you why, I t I'm supposed to give a 10 minute reading, so I'm using like two minutes right here. But I'll tell you why, because I, and I know this, this is, this is objective, this is not subjective. I have in, for this book, the best poetry book cover ever. So you are welcome to get the book and just display it on your coffee table. Okay, I'll read you some poems now. Now that everybody's gonna buy the book, right? 40 in the morning. My mother grew morning glories that spilled onto the walkway toward her porch because she was a woman with land who showed as much by giving it color. She told me I could have whatever I worked for. That means she was an American. But she'd say it was because she believed in God. I am ashamed of America and confounded by God. I thank God for my citizenship in spite of the timer set on my life to write these words. I love my mother. I love black women who plant flowers as sheepish as their sons. By the time the blooms unfurl themselves for a few hours of light, the women who tend them are already at work, blue, I'll never know who started the lie that we are lazy, but I'd love to wake that bastard up at 4 day in the morning, toss him in a truck, and drive him under God past every bus stop in America to see all those black folk waiting to go work for whatever they want. A house, a boy to keep the lawn cut, some color in the yard. My God, we leave things Green. I wrote this next poem after finding out and being confounded by the very long list of people who have supposedly committed suicide 
while in police custody. Uh, it includes people like um, Jesus Huerta in North Carolina, who uh, somehow managed to shoot himself in the back corner of his head um, while handcuffed on the walk from the police cruiser to the building where he was to be booked after having been patted down, managed to shoot himself in the back corner of his head, Victor White III from Louisiana, where I'm from, uh, who shot himself in his upper back while handcuffed, sitting in the back seat of a police cruiser after having been patted down. Um, the list is long, Sandra Bland um, in a cell after a day of fighting for her life uh, in a cell uh, where there is video footage, but the video goes out at just the moment that the coroner says she must have hung herself with a trash bag. Bullet points. I will not shoot myself in the head, and I will not shoot myself in the back, and I will not hang myself with a trash bag. And if I do, I promise you, I will not do it in a police car while handcuffed or in the jail cell of a town I only know the name of because I have to drive through it to get home. Yes, I may be at risk, but I promise you, I trust the maggots who live beneath the floorboards of my house to do what they must to any carcass, more than I trust an officer of the law of the land to shut my eyes like a man of God might, or to cover me with a sheet so clean my mother could have used it to tuck me in. When I kill me, I will do it the same way most Americans do, I promise you cigarette smoke, or a piece of meat on which I choke, or so broke I freeze in one of these winters we keep calling worst. I promise if you hear of me dead anywhere near a cop, then that cop killed me. He took me from us and left my body, which is, no matter what we've been taught, greater than the settlement a city can pay a mother to stop crying and more beautiful than the new bullet fished from the folds of my brain. Oh, so kind. Thank you. I wasn't going to read this poem, but, um, but Rob asked to hear it. So. Hero. She never knew one of us from another, so my brothers and I grew up fighting over our mother's mind. Like sun-colored suitors in a Greek myth, we were willing to do evil. We kept chocolate around our mouths. The last of her mother's lot, she cried at funerals, cried when she whipped me. She whipped me daily. I am most interested in people who declare gratitude for their childhood beatings. None of them took what my mother gave, waking us for school with sharp slaps to our bare thighs. That side of the family is darker. I should be grateful, so I will be. No one on earth knows how many abortions happened before a woman risked her freedom by giving that risk a name by taking it to breast. I don't know why I am alive now that I still cannot impress the woman who whipped me into being. I turned my mother into a grandmother. She thanks me by kissing my sons. Gratitude is black, black as a hero returning from war to a country that banked on his death. Thank God it can't get much darker than that. I'll finish with um, I'll finish with a duplex. A duplex is a, a feature of this book, so I want you to know about it. Um, the duplex is a form that I invented. It is a it is at once and whole a huzzle, a sonnet and a blues poem. And I think you're gonna hear all of those things when I read you the poem. If you think about what you know about Hustles, what we know about sonnets, what we know about the blues, the first American poetry form, the blues, um, you'll hear elements of that come out in this poem. And there are a few 
a few duplexes um, in the book. I wrote this poem because I was always getting, I wrote these poems, this, I made up this form, I invented this form because I was always getting called to the mat about my identity. People want to know, well, you know, you're 12% Southern and 15% Black. And, and I'm like, I just feel everything that I am whole. So um, this, is, uh, this is the form, whole. Duplex. I begin with love, hoping to end there. I don't want to leave a messy corpse. I don't want to leave a messy corpse full of medicines that turn in the sun. Some of my medicines turn in the sun. Some of us don't need hell to be good. Those who need most need hell to be good. What are the symptoms of your sickness? Here is one symptom of my sickness. Men who love me are men who miss me. Men who leave me are men who miss me in the dream where I am an island. In the dream where I am an island, I grow green with hope. I'd like to end there. Thank y'all so much. That was great. Thank you all for not going to Ruth Bader Ginsburg. <laughs> I wanted to go to Ruth Bader Ginsburg. That's the only reason I came. And then I find out that our events are at the exact same time. That is not right, not fair, and not good. <laughs> we saw an ambulance out front, and my friend said, I hope it's not Ruth. I said, no. Um, I'm going to read from, from my new and selected poems, which also has a lovely cover. Um, it's OK. It's OK. <laughs> the thing with my cover is it's called Only as the Day is Long. But if you turn it sideways, you realize it's a sunset over the ocean. Oh. Can yours do that? <laughs> Oh, it's going to be a fun conversation. <laughs> Go ahead. Mine is a pop-up. Does yours pop-up? <laughs> okay. okay, let's get some poems. Um, <laughs> so the first poem I'm going to read is from the final section, which are the new poems, um, which are all about my mother, who died a few years ago now. She was born in 1928, so she was a child of the Depression. Um, this first poem is also a form that was made up by Terrence Hayes, your competitor. And, uh, <laughs> and we didn't plan this. It just turned out this way. And it's called A Golden Shovel. And it takes a line from a poem by Gwendolyn Brooks and uses each word in the line in order as the poem's end words. So this is called Lapse. I am not deceived. I do not think it is still summer. I see the leaves turning on their stems. I'm not oblivious to the sun as it lowers on its stem, not fooled by the clock holding off, not deceived by the weight of its tired hands holding forth. I do not think my dead will return. They will not do what I ask of them, even if I plead on my knees. Not even if I kiss their photographs or think of them as I touch the things they left me. It isn't possible to raise them from their beds, is it? Even if I push the dirt away with my bare hands. Stillness, unearth their faces. Bring me the last dahlias of summer. And this is uh, called Death of the Mother, and it uses a, Don, John, a John Donne poem. Um, and I, uh, again, use his 
final rhymed words as the same final rhymed words in my own poem, uh, Death of the Mother. And the quote from John Donne is the first line of his sonnet, at the round earth's imagined corners, blow your trumpets, angels, and arise, arise. At day's end, last sight, sound, smell, and touch, blow your final breath into the hospital's disinfected air. Rise from your bed, mother of eight, the blue scars of infinity lacing your belly, your fractious hair and bony knees, and go where we can never find you, where we can never overthrow your lust for order, your love of chaos, your tyrannies of despair, your can of beer. Cast down your nightshade eyes and float through the quiet, your nightgown wrapped like woe around your shredded soul, your cavernous heart, that space you left us like a gift, brittle staircase of ifs we are bound to climb too often and too late. Unleash us. Let your grace breathe over us in silence when we can bear it, ground as we are into your loss. You taught us how to glean the good from anything, pardon anyone, even you, awash as we are in your blood. <laughs> this is uh, called Crow. When the air conditioner comes on, it sounds for all the world like my mother clearing her throat and then sighing. After she died, I'd shudder and look up, expecting to see her ghost. I wasn't afraid, only hopeful, to see her again, to hear her knees crack, her knuckles pop, the ash of her cigarette hiss and flare. She gargled with salt water, spit it into the sink, grabbed the phone with her claw, the back of her head sleek as a crow. My mother is a crow on my lawn, laughing with the others, flapping up on a branch, jerking and twisting her ruffed neck, looking around. I find her everywhere, her eyes staring out from aspen bark, the rivers of her hands, the horse's ankle bones, astounding such delicacy could bear such terrible weight. <laughs> and uh, this is clearly a mother reading. Um, <laughs> our mothers are very important people. They're epic, I think, in, um, in nature and in deed. And I feel more poems should be written about our mothers because without them, where would we be? Not here. This is called Arizona. The last time I saw my mother, she was sitting on the back patio in her nightgown, a robe thrown over her shoulders, the elbows gone sheer from wear. It was three months before her death. She was hunched above one of the last crossword puzzles she would ever solve, her brow furrowed over a seven-letter word for tooth. I was staying at a cheap hotel, the kind where everyone stands outside their front door to smoke. A cup of hotel coffee balanced on the butt end of the air conditioner, blasting its cold fumes over the unmade bed. The outdoor speakers played Take It Easy on a loop by the time I get to Phoenix and get back. It wasn't the best visit. My sister's house was filled with dogs, half-grown kids, and piles of dirty clothes. No food in the fridge, so we went out and got tacos, enchiladas, and burritos from the Filibertos a few blocks away. A squat tub of guacamole and chips, tumblers of horchata, orange fanta, and Mr. Pib. A thousand napkins. Everyone was happy while they chewed. The state of Arizona is a box of heat wedged between Las Vegas and Albuquerque. Not a good place to get poor or be sick or die. My mother rode a train from Maine in 1953. She was just a girl, me bundled in her arms, all the way to California. 
I've tried to imagine it. If you continue west on Route 66, it will branch upward and dump you into the spangle of Santa Monica, where I used to live. Then you can drive Highway 1 almost all the way up the Redwood Coast to Mendocino. I used to do that. I probably spent more time in my car than any house I lived in. My mother never knew where I was. She'd call and leave a message. This is your mother, as if I might not recognize her voice. And I'm just wondering where you are in these United States. She used to make me laugh. The whole family was funny as hell once. Dinner time was like a green room full of stand-up comics. That day, sitting with them over spilled salsa, I saw the damage booze and meth can do to a row of faces. The jokes were tired, and the windows behind them filled with hot white sky, plain as day. When I got back to the hotel, it was getting dark, but it had cooled off, so I took a walk around the parking lot. Strangers leaned out over their second floor balconies and shouted down at their friends, traipsing away in thin hotel towels toward the tepid blue pool. The moon was up, struggling to unsnag itself from the thorny crowns of the honey locusts, the stunted curbside pines. I left my tall mother on the couch where she was sleeping, flat on her back, her robe now a blanket, her rainbow-striped socks sticking out like the bad witch beneath the house in The Wizard of Oz. But she was not a bad witch, nor was she Glinda. That was my mother's brother's wife's name. We called her the bad witch behind her back. <laughs> my mother still wore her wedding ring, even after she remarried. Why spend good money on a new one when she liked this one perfectly well? She always touched it like a talisman, fretted it around her bony finger. Three kinds of braided gold, white, rose, and yellow. By the end, the only thing keeping it from slipping off was her arthritic knuckle. I don't know what my sister did with it after she died. I wonder if all that gold was melted down in a crucible, the colors mixing a muddy nugget. I do know that Route 66 in addition to being called the Will Rogers Highway and the Main Street of America, was also known as the Mother Road, from John Steinbeck's The Grapes of Wrath. My mother looked like a woman Walker Evans might have photographed with her dark wavy hair, wide forehead, and high cheekbones, one veined hand clutching her sweater at the collar, her face a map of every place she'd been, Every floor she scrubbed, every book she'd read, every ungrateful child she birthed that lived or died, every hungry, upturned mouth she fed, every beer she drank, every unslept night, every cigarette, every song gone out of her, every failure. Severe, you might say. She always looked slightly haughty, glamorous, and famished. I saw all the cars parked in that lot and wanted to hotwire one with a good radio. Drive away. Keep driving until the ocean stopped me. Then hairpin up the coast and arrive like an orphan at Canada's front door. If I'd known I'd never see my mother again, I wouldn't have done much different. I might have woken her, taken her tarnished shoulders in my arms, rocked her like a child. As it was, I bent over her and kissed her on the temple, a curl of her hair caught for a moment between the corner of my lips. This is my mother, I thought, her brain sleeping beneath her skull, her heart sluggish but still beating, her body my first house, the dark horse I came in on. <laughs> Wow, well, thank you both for incredible readings. Uh, it's true that I had wanted to begin by talking about how poems help us contend with the miracles and challenges and uh, incomprehensibilities of family. Um, 
specifically mothers, I suppose, because of the poems you've both written. Um, I was struck by how when you read those poems, you both read in a way that felt like a kind of incantation to both bring your mothers alive and to find a different way to talk about them and talk, even talk to them. And maybe you could speak to that. Mm -hmm. Oh, man. Is your mother still alive? She is still alive. And Lucky you know, me. I think this is the first time I wrote poems. I have poems about her from the past in my first two books. But in this book, I really felt like I got her right. And I felt like I had occasion. Mm -hmm. You know, I've never, one of the things that people always ask me is, what, are you, what does your family say about your poems? Uh -huh. and, I, and my response to that is always, why would my family see my poem? <laughs> and everybody's like, Or Wait. want to. Yeah, like, <laughs> but seriously, everybody's like, how is it that you don't show your, your family your poems? And I'm like, you work at Kroger, do you take your family to the checkout line? <laughs> like, nobody seems to be taking their parents to work with them. Why am I expected to? Right. But for whatever reason, when I wrote these poems, I did want my mother to see them because I felt like I finally got something to, yeah. I got her complexity down right. on the page. You know, all that power, yeah. that spirit, the spirit of melancholy, and yet the yeah. spirit of joy that seemed to exude all around her and move through our house. Um, and in, a, in the way that she, there's something about my mother um, where I, every time I see her, I know this more, but I, I have to remember that I know it. When I see her, I'm like, what is that thing? And then I'm like, oh yeah, that's that thing. My mother literally seems to, to me to carry all of her sisters and all of her ancestors. Like the women I knew, my, my grandmother, my grandmother's sisters, um, there's a way that my mother has all of that in her, and she had all of that in her the whole time I was growing up. Yeah. So that's what I was trying to get to mm -hmm. in these poems. Yeah, yeah, and exactly the same experience. You're trying to get, I use the word epic, but I think we see a lot of books and films and you know about the male's epic journey, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. manifest mm, destiny, yeah, yeah. and you know, and yet women were doing these, making these incredible incredible treks, you know, with children under their arms and, mm -hmm. you know, taking care of them and feeding them and rocking mm -hmm. them and, you know, mm -hmm. and, um, uh, and, and it really was an epic journey that my mother took and it was one of the last poems I wrote for the book and I felt the same way. I finally got her right. Mm -hmm. I got that thing mm -hmm. about her that I see, mm -hmm. which is very similar to your, everything behind her right. is massive, you know, mm -hmm. all the women who have trekked across all the countries of the world mm. to get to where they were going with children, with all their possessions, with you know, all their knowledge mm -hmm. of the earth and what, how to eat and how to mm -hmm. cure someone of mm -hmm. some sickness. And you know, my mother was an emergency room nurse, one of the first paramedics, first woman paramedics in California. And uh, it was great because she'd come home and tell us stories about the emergency room while we ate our dinner. <laughs> and, um, <coughs> But also, if any of us got hurt in any way, she'd take a look at it and you know, put some iodine on it. You know, unless it was a gaping, sucking wound, you know, she was not interested. You know, it was just take care of yourself, get the back dean, you know. And um, so to me, she was not only this mother who worked inside the home, but she was a mother who was out mm -hmm. saving lives mm -hmm. in addition mm -hmm. to saving our lives, you know. Mm -hmm. And yet she was very complicated. She was really a pretty disturbed person in many ways, you know, um, and, uh, and it was a very dysfunctional household that I wanted to get all of it, mm -hmm. you know, not just, mm -hmm. oh, my mother was this wonderful woman. Mm -hmm. My mother was this very complex and ter deeply, deeply mm -hmm. conflicted. Yeah. I think it's one of the things that make it difficult to be a poet in this world, yeah. the fact that people who aren't aware of what poetry actually is, yeah. you know, like, um, I think Laura Bush had this problem. She invited people to come to the White House during one of our wars to read poems, and then people wanted to read poems about our wars. Yeah. And she didn't understand why that would happen. She was like, oh, I just wanted poetry. But what she actually, I mean, that happened. I'm not, that just, that really yeah. happened. Yeah. Um, but, what, but what's interesting to me about that is that she wasn't aware of what poetry is. And when we're confronted with what poetry is, when we're confronted with the fact that poetry must carry with it yeah. what we are in real life, and we're never any one way. Like often what we want, what people think they want from poetry, they, they, don't, want from po they don't want poems, they want Hallmark cards. Because mm -hmm. Hallmark cards get us one way. Love is love. Yeah. 
It's your birthday. Have a good time. Yeah. That's the end of it. You know, a celebration is a celebration. Yeah. Do you understand what I yeah, mean? Of course. Um, they don't nothing. add to the Hallmark card, and pretty soon you will die. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's your birthday. When you're you're closer, closer to the end. And if, <laughs> if, if you're a poet, then you're going to include that. Thing. Right, yeah. of course, of course. Um, and I think that's part of, but that's part of what we're always, what I'm trying to do and what, what I know your poems do. Yeah. That first poem you read the first time I saw it, I didn't see it in a magazine. I saw it in the, um, the Best American yeah, Poetry. Oh, yeah. And I was so mad at you. <laughs> Girl, I was going to call you and cuss you out. I was so angry. That poem, that's a great poem. Yeah. That poem wears me out. Yeah. I'm so glad you read it. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. That's the greatest compliment you can get, that someone wants to kill you. That's what yeah. you want. <laughs> At least That's if they're another poet. The poets. Yeah. yeah, exactly, exactly. It's, it, it, it explains a little bit about how um, our wonderfully dysfunctional uh, little <laughs> group works uh, and supports each other. Um, speaking of bringing everything in, I wanted to talk a little bit about sex and how oh. sex connects to both violence and celebration in your poems. Mm -hmm. Um, you didn't read very explicitly sexual poems, but I think you two share a kind of ability to navigate and include in your poems that kind of muchness, that kind of overwhelming uh, truth about, about love and pleasure that only poems can do. Mm -hmm. yeah, well, one of the things that, um, that this book is about is uh, sexual assault. And uh, it's actually the thing I didn't want the book to be about. I didn't want to write poems yeah. about rape. I, didn't want to, I definitely didn't want to write poems about my own rape. Um, you asked me to read one of those poems, and I was like, no. <laughs> um, because it's, it's sort of difficult in front of people. You can write it, and you can put it in the world. Yeah. You can let people have it. But talking about it isn't as easy. Uh, in spite of the fact that you may have worked through the emotion right. Right. having written the poem. But what, what, I, what I wanted to do in this book more than anything wasn't just to write about that. I mean, I didn't want to write about that at all. I mean, I actually felt called to, I, I felt ethical, <coughs> which I think is the worst thing for a poet to ever yeah. feel. But there was so much in this world going on. Yeah. And there weren't really men talking about their experiences with it. Yeah. And there are so many men, so many of my very close friends, their first sexual experiences, they were having them before they were 10 years old. Right. And yet when all of the hashtag Me Too stuff was coming out, you were hearing from woman after woman after woman. And I felt that I had some kind of a responsibility, which is like the worst thing to feel. Mm -hmm. And yet I needed to answer to that. And so when those poems started calling to me, I gave them back the language that they were asking for. But what I, what I wanted to do in the book was to write a book not necessarily about that, but how to survive and right. enjoy sex after that, right. which is why the third section of the book right. is so much about right. good sex. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we really are brother and sister from another mother. I mean, yeah. just, you know, we're just writing the same thing, but, but yeah. from completely different yeah. perspectives and through very different lenses. Yeah. But uh, my very first book was called Awake, and it was about childhood sexual abuse. Mm -hmm. Did I want to write those poems? Did I want anybody to see them, including my family? Mm -hmm. Did I want the public to know that this had happened? I mean, I had a hard enough telling, time telling anybody, let alone you know, being public about it. But it's such a, a common event. We know that now. And then when the Me Too thing was going on, same thing. I kept thinking, well, OK, this is at the hands of strangers at jobs. You're an adult. Um, you know, what about children? What about, you know, what I kept thinking about was, what's her name? Um, ta ta uh, ta Taylor Swift, mm -hmm. right? Remember the guy puts his hand under her dress while they're being photographed? There, a guy next to her starts sticking his hand under her dress, and she freezes. She doesn't know what to do. And when she walks off stage, she tells someone, you know, and they respond. And the guy, she sues him for a penny, but, you know, sues the hell out of him. And I thought, this is Taylor Swift. She's one of the richest, most powerful young women in the world. And when someone grabs her in public, in front of a bunch of people, she freezes. She does not know what to do. She doesn't turn around and say, hey, knock it off, buddy. Mm -hmm. What the hell do you think you're doing? Right? Mm -hmm. That's how frightening it was. Hillary Clinton, 
She's got Trump behind her, looming that over her. That was crazy. Does, he turn, does she turn <laughs> around and say, hey, buddy, knock it off? What do you think you're doing? No. What is a four-year-old, what's her chance mm. of saying no? Mm. If these two powerful, rich, strong women can't say, hey, buddy, mm -hmm. right? So it just makes you so aware of how important it is that we do say me too, you know, that there are more forms of this kind of abuse that go on every day that people carry around their whole lives. Mm -hmm. And so for us to write about it, for whatever reasons we ended up writing about it, you know, it is a political act mm -hmm. in this culture, mm -hmm. in this time. Well, and I think to Jericho's point, you've also written great poems uh, in the New and Selected uh, about the pleasures of love, uh, the intimate and, and uh, sort of, uh, uh, incomprehensible pleasures of love that that live alongside that violence in a way that yeah. um, I think again only poems can capture well and that's a hopefully from you know again you know you don't plan on this result but it does show people that there is life after this kind of violence that you right. can transform it why should someone take from you your greatest pleasure, mm -hmm. you know. I mean, it's really, it's the only free thing we have that we can just, you know, and, um, and it's ours. And so they cannot take that from us. And I think it is, again, making this huge political statement that you did not get me. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, mm -hmm. I'm taking this back and I'm having it for myself, mm -hmm. yeah. you know. And, and for someone to read that, I think, is very empowering. Mm -hmm. yeah. For someone to read a poem by Jericho where they go, oh my God, this yeah. horrible thing oh my God, look at the pleasure he's having now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's his, and that means I can have it too. Yeah. Well, I'd finally, before we open up to questions, uh, just like to talk about the importance of play. Uh, I love that, Jericho, you read your duplex poems, mm -hmm. and Dorian, that you uh, read your gold, golden shovel poem, and then you read that poem that, that uh, engaged with John Donne yeah. too, Death of the Mother. And I'd like you to talk a little bit about how that kind of play with language, that play with form, uh, helps inform and helps maybe also push mm -hmm. what you're able to do, especially when contending with otherwise um, uh, uh, the topics that otherwise you couldn't find a way to uh, wrap your brain around. Right. Mm -hmm. um, play. I'll say this. Um, it's. And this is, this is sort of what I was thinking about when I was talking about being ethical or being responsible. Uh, the truth about me being able to make a poem is that I have to be available to language mm -hmm. so that I'm only dealing with the sounds of things as they come to me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's almost as if I'm saying things yeah. and not aware of what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. So. Um, if y'all, if anybody knows anything about music or anything about sheet music, the music is there and then you would have words right under the music. Do y'all understand what I mean? Mm -hmm. But without the words, the music still exists. Do y'all follow what I'm saying? So part of what I'm doing when I'm writing is I'm trying to find the right word that sounds like a note that's in my head. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, mm -hmm. especially in a first draft, yeah. The, that series of words makes no sense, mm -hmm. but they do follow this musical notation going on in my head. Yeah. Um, and because of that, because, and if I'm writing well, that's what I'm doing, right. I'm not. And everything is my, at my access. So often what I will say comes from my personal experience, comes from some scientific fact that I happen to know, um, some trivia that I know more than anybody else in this room about yeah. Diana Ross and the dreams. <laughs> some, you know, um, all of those things have to be at my access yeah. when I'm writing poems. Do you know, mm -hmm. Every story I've ever overheard, mm -hmm. do you understand what I'm saying? And because all those things are at my access and I just need language, I need sentences, I need phrases, I need lines, then any one of those things could at any moment fall into the poem. Do y'all see what I'm saying? Does that make sense? Yeah. So then once I've done <laughs> it and I look back at it, I've said a bunch of stuff <laughs> that I did not expect to say. By accident. <laughs> yeah. And that's why when you read the poems, hopefully, you're surprised. Because I too am surprised. <laughs> that's why you, you get the unexpected. Because I got the unexpected. Yeah. That's why you cry. Because I look back and I start crying like, oh my God, what was I thinking? Yeah. Do you, do you, 
because I tapped into the subconscious, which is, which is what I was interested in doing with the duplex. I mean, right, right. in particular with those poems, I had these lines yeah. that were sitting around that weren't yeah. working, that had been written. I liked them individually. Yeah. Yeah. I cut them up and I put them all over my house. Uh -huh. And I just started putting lines together to see what would sing. If I smash these two lines together, if I juxtapose these mm. two lines, mm. what sings? What has meaning? What makes meaning just because they're side by side? So those are the kinds of things that I'm doing yeah. when I'm making poems. And that's the ways in which I try to tap into the subconscious so that the poems are making themselves. And I'm not putting mm -hmm. my intentions mm -hmm. on them. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Exactly. If you're listening to a higher order of sound, you're not so interested in what it is you're actually saying. You're just trying to grab that. My mother was a pianist. And um, so she every day played piano and she played everything from classical piano to rock tunes to pop music to you know whatever I mean she just could play anything and um, and even though I never learned how to play the piano I spent a lifetime listening to musical phrases yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. and and how they affected me as a human being what what feelings would emerge out of what series of notes and yeah. And uh, so when I write, I do exactly the same. I'm listening to some weird music in my head that I'm following along with words, you know, in some way. And, uh, and without that, I can't do it, which is why I could never write fiction. Huh. Because there was no music to yeah. follow. I didn't, You're supposed you know, to tell a story? Yeah, what, what story? I don't know. For why? You know, yeah, why? <laughs> it's supposed to be, mu you know, note, word, note, word, you know? Yeah. And, uh, <coughs> Although my poems are very narrative and they do tell stories. I was going to say, I mean, you both are able to move between the lyric yes. and the narrative mode yes. and uh, um, also find ways to embed stories within stories in your yeah. narrative poems. Yeah, if I had to get someone from one room into another, I would be lost. Yeah, yeah. But if I can just sing about them mm -hmm. and their journey and whatever comes in, comes in. Oh, here's Route 66 all of a sudden. Oh, right. here's, right? You know, I didn't know that shit was going to come in. I didn't know there was going to be a hotel room and an air conditioner and, a, you know, whatever. I mean, just comes in. So for writing fiction, it's very bad because there is no ending. There is yeah. no plot. There is no yeah. really any um, scene or um, landscape or, you know, any of the things you need yeah. for fiction. So I figured this out about the lyric when I was very young and I heard this song by Minnie Ripperton called Loving mm. You. Y'all uh -huh. know this song? Oh, everyone knows this song, right? Um, she hits really that high note. I can't do that. La 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 la. Do 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 do. Very good, right? That's pretty good, you know. I love that song. But one of the lyrics in that song is no one else can make me feel the colors that you bring. Yes. Oh, yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. Now, that's Synesthesia. Yeah, no joke. Seriously. That's pretty good. No one, I mean, and if that's not a story, I don't know. Yeah. But that's not plot. That is right. narrative, though. Right. 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 That does have in it a beginning, a middle, and an end. Yeah. And over and over again in my yeah. poems, that's what I've been trying to do as it relates to narrative. It's not that I have a plot, right? I can't get, it's, I, I love fiction. You yeah. Know. Me too. I, admire I mean, I like all kinds of second ray genres. I <laughs> <laughs> Don't tell anyone we said that. It's a joke. Poetry is the Now highest. all these fiction writers here are like, Jericho, I was yeah, going to write yeah, a book. Yeah. <laughs> Buy the book. Great cover. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> um, and yet, what I want to do in a poem is I want to make that kind of narrative yeah. happen. No one else can make me feel the colors that you bring. She's told yeah. us a lot yeah. about well, herself, bring her past, her present. <laughs> And bring oh. such a surprise too. You know, right. it has this move, and then suddenly bring comes in, and you're like, "Whoa!" Mm -hmm. Colors that you bring, mm -hmm. huh? And that's what poems can do. You know, with just one simple word, right. and can sort of upend everything. Right. Yeah. Right. Uh, anybody have any questions? We don't have that much time, but come on up. Yeah, it's the mic right up here. You can come next, ma'am. Go ahead. I love uh, questions. Yeah, I was struck by Jericho's comment about your comfort of writing about your mother in particular while she's still here. And I'm wondering, Dorianne, if you know, you noticed a shift in your writing about your mother from when she was alive to now that she's passed? Well, a little bit. She's always been my muse and, and I've always written about her, but it's true. I don't think I would have written about her quite so um, 
in quite as complex a way. You know, um, one time I wrote a poem about her where I said something about uh, at night she came home and drank a six pack of beer before she went to bed. My mom read that poem and she said, I don't drink a six pack of beer before I go, don't tell people that, you know? Well, I mean, she did, but whatever. So I changed it to drinks her dark beer and goes to bed, you know, so that she would look like she was drinking a nice stiff ale and, you know, she called it quits. And um, she was a low down alcoholic, you know, there's just yeah. no way around. Well, now in these poems, I can talk about that more freely, you know, um, because it did, it, it was who she was, you know, it was part of what I grew up with. Um, and so, yeah, I have more freedom in talking about her now, but I also, I think, feel more tender toward her than I did when she was actually alive. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, because I see now the epicness of her journey. You know, you yeah. can't really know someone's mm -hmm. journey until they're done with it. Mm -hmm. right. And so I think I understand her more now that she's dead than I ever did when she mm -hmm. was alive. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, we've run out of time. I'm sorry. That's so sad. Um, I know. I wish we could talk more, but uh, you can go to the book signing. Oh, get yes. these books. Get these we books. We will answer all of your questions. They at will the answer book all of your questions. If you have a book for us. Yeah, to sign. totally. So That's get the, the books. That's the only requirement. Yes. A book. Uh, thanks so much for hanging out with us. It was a beautiful, wonderful time. Thanks Thank to Jericho you. and Dorian. Thank you, Rob.